Now we're diving in at Luke chapter 18. So if you have got your Bibles open, actually it would help. I know it will come up on screen, but there's other parts I am going to be alluding to here, and, um, and I'm going to sort of pull out in this passage. So um, please open your Bibles up at Luke chapter 18. And if you do that, I will do that too. We're at Luke 18, verse 18. A certain ruler, Mark's gospel calls him a rich young ruler. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Well, I'm just going to pull out as much as I can out of this. You know, we're 10 days in from the general election and the repercussions are still going. I mean, what a week. I mean, if you're into politics, this has been such a week for you. You have been thoroughly intrigued with what's going on. But it seems to me that one of the big decisions that voters faced was, which party could you trust with the economy? Is that correct? I know, Scotland aside, just, I don't like to put Scotland aside because I know there's some Scottish people here. Uh, But Scotland aside... uh, You know, it it was a, as was it Jesse J, it's all about the money, money, money. And uh, you were impressed with that, I know. So was I. Uh, It's about money matters. Who, Who could you trust the economy with? And it's about the money. That's what's so important. And these next two weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about is money. Actually, to be more specific... We're going to be talking about God and money. Now, apparently, I am told this, all a preacher has to do is mention the word money. And it sets off, this is apparently, for some um, internal reverberations go around. And things like this go on in the head like, why did I choose this Sunday to come? And I, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I brought my friend and the big thing they have is about the church asking for money. That's, ah, oh, no, how could you do this? Neil, I'm going to have a word with you afterwards. Or, I feel uncomfortable already, and you haven't said anything yet. I understand that. Actually, these, re- these reactions, by the way, are not invalid. Now there'll be reasons why there'll be reverberations going on. We promised we would do this after we... At, we, at the church meeting, that because we needed to. We needed to talk about uh, God and money. And um, reactions that people respond to are sometimes quite reasonable. You know, sometimes there's an undercurrent of guilt. God, I really haven't given enough. I just, I just haven't, you know, I don't, I don't participate in that side of things. Or, or for some... There are the financial struggles, terrible financial struggles. Listen, debt is debilitating. It saps the life out of you. 
even the word money depresses people like that. I worked for the Abbey National Building Society many years ago. I worked there for five years. I sat across the table with people who couldn't pay their mortgages for many months. So I'm not coming green here. I understand this. I understand why people have buried, buried the letters so that the other person, the partner or the wife doesn't see them or the husband doesn't see them. I, I get this. So for some, it, money is really depressing. For others, you, and you may have been, some of you may have been on the end of this, you've been put off by leaders or TV evangelists, uh, for whom some are, actually they just seem particularly interested in your money. That's, that's what's going on. And, and quite frankly, they, you know, to have been on the end of some angles of the prosperity gospel, and don't get me wrong, God wants to prosper us. I, I get that, but it's a whole thing, not just a financial package. It's a whole thing. And some of the prosperity gospel teaching, actually, listen to me, is being thoroughly ungodly. It's be, and that my grandson ag- agrees with me over there on that side. It's been thoroughly ungodly. And what's more, it's been an abusive use of Scripture. I have sat... I'm getting warmed up now. I sat, you know, I have sat when people have done a preamble to the offering and it's taken 20 minutes. And I mean, it's just steam starts coming out my ears. I have been to places, you know, I'm just ashamed to say this. I have been to places where at the meeting, there before, for the offering, those who gave $100 got the whole Bible on tape. Those who gave $50, well, you only got the New Testament. And I had steam coming out my ears. That is, what about the widow's might? Somebody needs to shout in that person's... All right, I'll cool down. I'll just pack off. All I'm saying is, is that, and very often, you know, it's the weak and the vulnerable people taken for a ride. So I understand reactions like this. Having said that, and in spite of that, it is no reason for us not to talk about money or what we classify as stewardship. And neither can we play selective games with Bible passages. I like this one, I don't like this one. I like this one, I don't like that one. That's just as bad as the selective passages of the prosperity gospel teachers. Just not having it. Not only that, So on top of all that, there's a reticence in our culture to talk about money. Uh, It really is. So if you're, in my position, you're in a no-win situation. That's the way it is. But listen, to ignore this is simply unbiblical. We cannot do that. It plays too big a part of our lives. It reflects our time, our endeavor, our treasure. To ignore it is simply foolish. And God isn't silent about this either. You know, Jesus was not embarrassed to talk about money. Apparently, he talked about money four times more than prayer or faith. Really? One of the um, one of the guys, it's um, Randy Alcorn, writes this book on money, possessions, and eternity, and he was going to do this series on, um, on 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 wealth and possessions. And in the end, he wrote this book because he didn't realize, he hadn't realized how much God spoke about money. And the truth is, so many of life's problems, worries, complexities, actually they revolve around the theme of money. Jesus addresses this. And when he addresses it, he doesn't address it as some minor detail. It's not, because it isn't. Suppose you were to go to the doctor, and you sat in the doctor's room, and you said, and he says, come on then, tell me what's going on. He said, do you know, I've been feeling unwell. I've been feeling unwell for quite a while. I, I can't hold my food down. I feel, I just have these feelings of nausea. I just feel nauseous most of the time. I, I get these headaches. Sometimes they're just blinding headaches. And, uh, and, and on top of that, I can't remember the last time I had a good night's sleep. I can't, just can't remember the last time I slept properly. 
So your doctor most likely is going to ask you questions about your lifestyle. It's going to ask you questions about your diet, whether you exercise or not. Is there anything at work or at home unsettling you? This is what he's going to do. You're not going to turn to him and say, hey, look, just stick to the physical, will you? You know, I'm giving you the symptoms. You know, give me the answer. He's not going to do that. It's a whole life thing. We come as a whole package, body and soul. It's all connected, my friends. So we're going to have a look at three things. I just like doing three things, but it's just the way it is. But I'm going to look at three things, and it's one, it's this. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the mind. And it's a matter of the future. That's what we're going to pull out. Matter of the heart, matter of the mind, and a matter of the future. So here we are in this passage, and Jesus' approach to this young man is intriguing. So he asks, comes... And he has these questions about eternal life. It's a strange, it's interesting. I'm fascinated by this. So Jesus goes down the route of works. Ten commandments. He just starts talking about ten commandments. You know the ten commandments. And the guy does. He he knows them. He does them. He knows them. He does them. He, you think, Jesus, why did you go down this approach? You know, only a few verses prior to this. So in the same chapter, Jesus is telling this story about a Pharisee and the tax collector. And that they go to the temple to pray. And and the Pharisee, the Pharisee stands before God and he lists all the things he does. All his works you know, and I, I, I fast, and I, and I tithe, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's all his works. And the tax collector, he stands before God, and he beats his chest, and he cries out for mercy. And he acknowledges he's a sinner. And Jesus declares the tax collector justified more than the other, i.e. the Pharisee. And yet, And the Pharisees done a list of works. And then Jesus comes to this rich young ruler and he does the work stuff. Weird, isn't it? Why does he do that? Because he knows the rich young ruler thinks he doesn't have a problem. Apparently Polly Toynbee, she's a writer for the Guardian newspaper, who doesn't... Like Christianity said, of all the elements of Christianity, the most repugnant is the notion of Christ taking our sins on himself and died in agony to save our souls. Did we ask him? This young ruler doesn't think he has a problem either. Ten C's, Ten Commandments, I've been there, done it got the t-shirt. He thinks he's okay. Do you know, I love the way Jesus does this. Jesus will always meet you where you are, not where you think you ought to be or where he thinks you should be. He starts with where you are. You know, doesn't he do that with the woman at the well? He starts, he's talking to this woman at the well. If you're a woman at the well, you're going to talk about water and they talk about water. That's what they do. If you're in Britain, you'll talk about the weather. That's what you do. See, he meets a person where they are. Now, with this man, he, he wants to know, this man wants to know, what does he have to do? Get that? What do I have to do? So, Jesus engages him at the point of works, doing. He doesn't think he has a problem, but, you know, something's gnawing away in him. Something's missing. It's the same with the woman at the well. Jesus starts talking about living water. And she says, sir, give me this water. And he says, go get your husband. And she says, 
I have no husband. And Jesus responds and says, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. And there's the issue. So Jesus starts at the point where the person's at and then moves them along the journey to the point, to the issue. And her issue is men. That's her issue. Listen, you can do a moral thing here. And, you know, that she's living with this man. And, and, and that's fair dues. But the point is, it's the issue is she's looking to men for her security. Now, most women here will tell you, don't bother. <laughs> Look, they bit. Just don't bother. You're looking for men for the security and happiness and the whole way forever of your life. Go think another thought. You know, it's just, it's, so this is the issue for her. Now, here we are. Here's this young man. You know the commandments. I've done them since I was a boy. <laughs> Must have been a pause at this point. Sell everything you have. Do you know, Francis, I looked at those words too on that last song. And I turned around to Des and said, Whoa, these are big words. These are big words. I mean, the rule of words really got to me. You know, this rich young ruler, like every addict, is in denial. And suddenly Jesus, go sell everything you have. Wow, that's a line, isn't it? That's like stuffing smelling salts under you. Well, you know, if you ever um, give away my secrets, whiteboards, you know your whiteboard markers? Uh, have you ever put one of those underneath your nose? Oh, everything suddenly comes to, wow, that's different. Go sell everything you have. <gasps> wow. That's different. This is a matter of the heart. Jesus is not looking for your donation. He's looking for your heart. Listen. It's just, if you don't get this, you'll miss everything. If giving is a duty, you'll just miss it. It's a heart thing. It's a real heart matter. Everything follows the heart. Where your treasure is, Jesus said, there will be your heart also. He never saw this com coming. He's completely blind to it. And suddenly, whoa. Tim Keller did a series on the um, seven deadly sins. And his wife asked him what he would be speaking on the following week. And he said, Greed. And she said, is that what you've called your talk, greed? And he said, yes. She said, your attendance will be down this week. <laughs> she was absolutely right. And the reason she said was, everyone thinks it has nothing to do with them. Nobody sits there and says, do you know what? I'm greedy. Nobody does that. Everybody points to somebody else who can spend more than them. Nobody does it. One of the hallmarks of addiction is denial, and an alcoholic will always think they're in control. That's the stock line. I'm not an alcoholic. Sorry, right, I'm in control. I won't... Um, they will say they're managing their intake. Jesus says this. Christians, Jesus says this. You cannot serve God and money. You can't do it. Money is a terrible master. Money is a terrible master. The master says, go here, and he goes. The master says, go there. The master says, do this, do that. The master influences, the master controls, the master applies pressure. Young man, you cannot serve both God and money. Have you made up your mind who you're serving? You cannot serve God and money. This is not about money per se. It's about your life and how you live. 
This is not about money. It's about your life and how you live. It's so important, this. In Luke chapter 6, please stay with me, because this is so important. In Luke 6, verse 37, Jesus says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, poured into your lap. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Listen, I've heard this verse. Give, and it shall be given to you. I've heard this verse. I mean, people give me this verse many times. Give, and it shall be given to you. You know, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. There's, there's our context here. And the context is the whole of your life. Don't be judgmental. Don't be condemning. Be forgiving. Give. That's the context. If you separate finances out and just give your favorite finance thing, text, you know, you'll just isolate it. Think it's for special occasions or something like that. You'll treat it as optional or occasional. No, first of all, it's a matter of the heart, my friends. And secondly, it's a matter of the mind. He has a decision to make. Go sell all you have. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? He thinks about it. Mark in his gospel tells us that this young man went away sad. He went away sad. He went away sad. He walked away. He made a decision. Listen, don't underestimate the power of money. Please, you're going to say, I'm not a rich young ruler. I'm not a rich young ruler. Don't underestimate the power of money. If you don't listen to God on this, you'll end up listening to the enemy. If you don't listen to God on money, you'll end up listening to the enemy. Some people need to be free from the love of money, the security of money. If we find it awkward, perhaps that says more about us than it says about God. Jesus cares about this because he cares for you. Mark tells us that before... Before Jesus says these words, he looked at him. Do you know, I love this about Jesus. So personal. He looked at him and loved him and said, go sell all you have. Here's your issue. Here's your point. This is where it's at for you. He loved him. (laughs) Jesus cares about this because he cares for you. One of the names for a Christian is a believer. We're to believe in Jesus. We trust in Jesus. You know, trust Jesus for this part of your life. My friends, giving is part of growing. Randy Alcon, that writer that I said to you recently, money, possessions, eternity, he says, I've never seen a mature Christian who is not also a mature steward. Let me just say that again. I've never seen a mature Christian who's not also a mature steward. When Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your place for tea. <laughs> I'm coming, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus responds and says to him when, he, when Jesus arrives, Lord, look, look, look. I've given away half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, this is a tax collector, say, I will pay them back four times. Jesus doesn't say, hey, that's a good idea. Never thought about that. Well, that's a really good idea. He says, no, he doesn't. He says this. He said, today salvation has come to your house. It's a whole deal, my friends. It's a whole deal. Radical transformation. We b- Christians, believers, we belong to a different kingdom. It works differently to this world. This world has a bumper sticker that says, he who has the most toys wins. <laughs> he doesn't. They, he, they don't go with him. It's not true. No person at the end of their life said, do you know what? I wish I spent more time in the office. Nobody does that. It's not a strap line. You know, the early church, 
hallmark of the early church, boy, was huge giving. Jews noticed, the Romans noticed, the Romans wrote about it. You'll find it in the, in the, in the articles and letters that they wrote of Julian to Pliny, and, and they wrote about the generosity of the early church. You know, they care not just for their own, but they care for our people as well. He was indignant about it. You have to know what kingdom you're a part of. We're a different kingdom, my friends. Therefore, we have to be wise in our attitude and our use of money. It's a matter of the heart, but it's also a matter of the mind. Better think this through. What does the Bible say about it? The Bible says it's better to give than to receive. Not, you, you need to give. You need to work this out. Have you, you don't realize the truth of that until you do it. <laughs> that's, that's a fundamental truth. That's what faith is. It's a, better to give than to receive, and it is. You won't know the truth, my friends, until you do it. First thing that you need to know is that the wealth and possessions you have are not yours. They're not yours. They're the, earth, they're the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. Everything in it, the world and everyone in it. The Bible says this, Christians, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. It's ironic, isn't it? With children, you give them some sweets. I don't know if you've done You give them some sweets. And then as they're chewing their way through, you go, can I have one? And they go, mine. Mine. It's like Lord of the Rings, precious. You know. it's just a, I, I never taught my children that. Mine. You know, they, they go to somebody's house. They grab a toy. It's somebody else's house, for goodness sake. Mine. Do you know, I tried this on one of my grandchildren last week. He had two bars of chocolate. It was a dedication, and there was chocolates being given out. He had two bars of chocolate. I said, I said oh, can I have one? And he said, yeah, sure. I thought, wow, that's a boy, isn't it? I thought, that's my grandchild. <laughs> And then I said, no, 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 you, you keep it. And he goes off to give it to his brother. I thought, oh, how sweet. Go on, do that. Ah, oh, I like that. It's so sweet. Comes to the second meeting. So you can wait around for him. I'll introduce you. This is unusual. You know, and so children do that with their sweets. When they're older, you know, you have this argument with you. And parents, I, they do argue. You, you get that, don't they? The teenagers, they argue with you. And then they stomp their feet. I'm going off to my room. My room. Whose room? I can't remember signing over the deeds of that room to them. Whose room? Mine. We're stewards. It's all the Lord's. He's a giver. You will never lose out. Have you ever sat down and worked this out and asked questions about your giving? Give and it shall be given to you. A good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. Poured into your lap. I was with somebody this week and this is their story. And they said they're not a person who's earned lots of money. But God, they've been faithful in their giving. And boy, has God been faithful back. So it's a great story, great testimony. I'm glad I was taught this as a young Christian. I was taught about tithing, actually. I was taught about tithing, uh, but uh, about regular giving, tithing. But to be quite honest... You know, it's such a huge step. And they're like, wow, tithing. <laughs> tithing, 10%. You must be off your head. 10%. What do you think I am? A rich young ruler? But anyway, so I all about this, but an elder come to me. And let me say this about tithing, by the way. People who mark this as a destination. The early church didn't. They're radical. A radical generosity. Marked with a radical generosity. That's the problem with tithing, is it's marked as a destination. No, no, no. But this elder said to me, start where your faith is, Neil. Come on, start where your faith is. 
It's amazing how quick God will increase your faith once you start. It really is. My friends, just, we just started with regular giving and it grew from there. We regularly review our giving. It's a stretch. But then I noticed the vision of the church is a stretch. It's always going to be like this. It's not legalism. It's not legalism. We walk by faith. You know, you bring this stuff into the storehouse to the church. And what does the church do with it? It's got, it's got, it thinks of the future. There's a ministry to be done through the church. So it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the mind. And it's a matter of the future. You'll see our, we see our investment already in the future. You know, we have 60 youngsters, 60 youngsters between the age of 8 and 12, not here this weekend. They're having a great weekend with Ben and Claire and I hope lots of other people helping them. 60 youngsters. Some church will get their eye teeth have 60 just in that age bracket. We see an increase with our, uh, in our children's work, our youth work. We see people saved, baptized, numerical growth. Ordinary people transformed into passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'll give to that. I'll give to that, my friends. God has said, I have many people in this place. That means eternal life for these people. I'll respond to that. So last month we spoke about we spoke about this to the members of the church. And we're in a position where our finances haven't caught up with our growth. I think, to be quite honest, that's part of our, we've been remiss in our teaching. I lay that at my door. We haven't been specific enough on this aspect of Christian life. I'm so grateful for gift day. If you weren't here last week, by the way, gift day was 80,000 pounds. 80,000 pounds. Praise the Lord. But you can't keep relying on a gift day. Gift day should be for specific things and particular items or whatever you're pioneering. You can't rely on that. It's got to be the general giving. John is going to be speaking about this next week. He's going to speak how and what. He'll put a giving challenge in front of you. I've told you already. So I look forward to seeing you here next week. So, <laughs> I'll make a note of you if you're not. No, no, sir. Look, giving, my friends, you can't look at, you just need, don't look any further than Jesus. You can't look any further than him. Who did not think equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. He humbled himself. Became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Stripped naked, dying for you. You were Jesus' future investment. It's a matter of the future. God has said to us, I have many people in this place. And we want to be a ministry to them. Not just abroad, but here in High Wycombe. We want to be a ministry to these people. I have many people. Jesus invested his life for you. That was future investment. So my friends, go home and ask questions and think and say, we're going to be there next week or I'm going to be there next week and see what John has to say on part two of God and money. Amen?